to order. The first uh, item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And the first uh, item under the superintendent's report is the comments by the high school representatives. Mr. Wagstaff here? Are you, are you going to be... Oh, there he is. Uh, are you going to report? Who's going to... Rep is there going to be a report by the representative of the high school students? You don't need to make one if you don't have one. It's not required. Uh, but if you do have something prepared, this is the time for us to hear from you. You have something that uh, you, you had in mind that you wanted to tell us tonight about what's happening at the high school? No, sir, not much has happened so far. All right, well. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. Probably, Brian, you may want to tell us something about uh, this teenage television that we're hearing a lot about that. Oh, yeah. Oh. Well, uh, Brian, tell you what to do. Come over by the microphone so uh, that uh, your parents can watch you at home. This one right here? Yes. OK. Um, last year, Mrs. Martin brought up um, the fact that we could use the Cape Channel as to do like a sort of a news program on it last year. And it got put, it got put off. So we never really got around to doing it. So this year, um, I was really interested in it because my, what I want to do um, in college and stuff is go into broadcast journalism. So I thought, what a better way to start off and have like a news program on, on um, like to start up a news program on the Cape Channel since we have access to it. So the first one went out Thursday night, last Thursday, and it went pretty well. Um, Mrs. Ferguson showed me how to use all the equipment and everything and use the editing. And the first one came out real well, and we, from that one we learned, um, we learned a lot from it. We learned different things we can do to make it better, and different things that need to be done. So it's going to be like, what's gonna, it's going to cover what goes on in um, Cape Elizabeth community and in the high school and different sports and everything. And you know, whatever anyone in the community has wants to submit something, um, we can put it on the air. So that's basically what it is, and it's going to be. Every, thir every, every other Thursday, not every Thursday, it's going to be every other Thursday at 7.30 on Channel 38. So that's basically what that Great. is. That sounds very interesting, Mr. Superintendent. Tell me, where uh, we would like very much to tape and produce the Math Mania woman that's with us, president of Math Mania. And uh, she's going to meet with parents here next week and it'll be a working session. Do you have the capability or anyone that can produce and direct that so the quality would be very good? Um, where, is it gonna be here? Right here in this studio. Yeah, because we have the cameras, we can, yeah, we could probably do that. Do you, do you want it to be taped or do you want it to go out live? We would like to tape it and then show it periodically so that uh, the parents could see what we're doing with this consultant. Would you give me a call sure. tomorrow so that we could work out how we might get this accomplished? Okay, now when's this going to be? Well, the program will be next week, and okay. but you, I'm sure you'll need a little time. I'd want her to spend some time with you about, she's going to be working around a series of tables, and she's very particular as to how she likes to have it done. Okay. So we'd be more than happy to talk with you about it. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, Superintendent, will you tell us about the opening day of school? I was sure you're going to tell us that it went smoothly. It always does. I've been here six years. We've never had a bad opening day yet. 
that's uh, like baseball season. We probably will get one one of these days, but <laughs> we're very fortunate. And I think uh, first I, I want to compliment the administrators who spend the summer organizing all this, and naturally the teachers who come with a great deal of enthusiasm. Now, I, the best thing I can say is this: on the first day, I spent uh, a half a day in the schools, and I went to a number of classes, and I got the feeling that everybody had been going at it. Uh, it felt like, uh, you know, February 15th, which is exactly what we want to see. In other words, the first day people were really going to work, and that pleased me a great deal. I want to pass that on to you, and I compliment the administrators for organizing the place the way it should be. So that's about all I can say. It was a smooth opening. If uh, you want to see what we look like on a full day, when the sun's out particularly, if you look at you go through every one of the schools in the morning, and then in the afternoon take a look at all the fields, and whether we're winning or losing. And you know how we do athletically. There's a report in there this evening that really gives you a detailed uh, analysis of what we're all about. And uh, it's a nice sight to look over the fields and see all the color and everybody participating. And you know, we've got a first now that we, some 70% of those young people will be participating in some kind of activities in the afternoon. So that, too, pleases me. So we're off to a good start, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next, I believe you have some co uh, correspondence from the Jewish Federation, which you wish to share yeah. with us. That was one of our problems, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge that uh, it was a problem. I met with some mothers who complained, uh, and some young people. A number of the teachers were um, we're using new materials and testing, and I dug through uh, the, our policy manual to find a guideline. It wasn't in the policies, but it's a number 19 guideline on religious holidays. And I put that in your backup. It's very similar to the one in Portland. And what I'm suggesting is uh, this year I put a, uh, small brochure from the Anti-Defamation League in the payrolls before school. But next year, I'm going to suggest that the administrators talk with the teachers and we put the policy in the paychecks early in September and make a, 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 real, uh, a real thing of the whole thing so that uh, people are alerted to these holidays and uh, the fact that we should not, because we have a large number of youngsters uh, give test or bring out new material. I've talked to the administrative council about this, and I think that's the best way to handle the situation. But I want to acknowledge that we're going to do something about it for the people who uh, spoke with me, and I wanted to bring it to your attention because I'm sure you've got some calls. Well, uh, uh, incidentally, you provided us with a copy of administrative guideline number 19. Let me just read it for the people in the audience and uh, watching at home. This is entitled Religious Holidays. This is an administrative guideline of the Cape Elizabeth School Department. It says, our school department has a long and positive history of respecting family needs within educational programming. This directive officially requests that no major examinations or school-sponsored co-curricular activities be conducted during the school days, during the school day, on dates when students of various faiths are absent in observance of holy days. Examples of these days are Jewish New Year, Day of Atonement, and Good Friday. Now, I guess the, 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 the question is, is this administrative guideline uh, <coughs> sufficient to answer the question that has been posed to us by the Jewish Federation? I think so. I think uh, the key is to get it out at the appropriate time, spell out the holidays. These were only examples, of course. Are there? Yes. Uh, this guideline says nothing about, um, no, says nothing about new material. It says major tests, and it says um, co-curricular activities. It does not mention. I guess I, I bring this up because the teachers, I believe, are confused. I, I talked with the teacher after school today who said, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do during those days. Uh, I, I talked with some children in some classes. 
they're playing Trivial Pursuit because it's an in-house school holiday. In other classes, it's, it's business as usual with no uh, you know, regard at all to the fact. And so I, I think that this is not a sufficient guideline. And, um, and I guess it isn't even a policy if it wasn't in the policy manual, but I think that this probably needs to be, um, have some more thought given to what exactly we want well, adhered to and then spell it out. I would, I would suggest that minimally uh, we do not test, uh, we do not uh, attempt to have co-curricular activities. Uh, we even uh, made an attempt to avoid athletic competition on those times, but we do not have complete control over that. You know, that's sort of the association. But I think minimally we could have the testing and new materials, and I agree. I think we should not present new materials when large numbers of youngsters out and cannot make that up. So what I could do is uh, be more than happy to uh, rewrite this and bring it back to the board with those two ingredients as well as the co-curricular and... All right, how example, many days are we looking at? Which is? How many days are we looking at? I think they're primarily no three at the most. No, I would, uh, wouldn't pass over, or shouldn't pass over, be added to this list. You have uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Good Friday. Yeah, these were examples. Uh, I see, but, policy, but, but I think, I, think uh, I tried to think about it myself, what uh, days, uh, put it right down you know, major religious holidays that uh, the school is in session, and I think it's those four. But I, you know, obviously you could draw the line elsewhere. Yeah, you know, I you think you had to be, Wednesday. yeah, I think, well, frankly, what, uh, uh, and I'm going to ask everybody's opinion on this, go around the table and ask anybody, if anybody in the audience wants to comment on this, but it, relative to what Peter just said, uh, I think, uh, Daryl, we've got to get fairly specific with this because uh, uh, I happen to have been baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church. You know, they have a different Good Friday and different calendar altogether, and I don't know that you want an administrative guideline or school board policy that gets, you know, there's so many different holidays. Uh, you get people uh, of my religion coming in and saying, oh, well, this is uh, Greek Orthodox uh, Good Friday and Greek Orthodox Maundy Thursday and don't teach any new materials because pretty soon we'll have no, no new materials for many days during the year. So I think you've got to be, we've got to be careful. We've got to be explicit. It's a problem that the Jewish Federation has raised and, uh, and one I think we've got to accommodate, but I think we have to do it more explicitly than we have. I don't think we can use the word example in here, for instance. Well, there's no problem with making it very explicit. Yeah. You know, if we hear what you want, then I'll make it very explicit. Yeah. Well, well one of the problems, I think, is that in many instances, it's not so much that they're missing new material, it's that they can't make contact with the teacher to get the material that was missed. You know, they can chase them down for a week trying to come up with a, you know, a time that they can sit down and understand what the assignment was that they missed. I think maybe rather than start listing six or eight or ten holidays in various religions, Perhaps we should approach it from the standpoint that the, the student is to let the teacher know in advance, the teacher is to give them the material or tell them what material will be covered, and then provide a time that the two can sit down together and go over the missed material. I, I hate to see us take a 175-day school year, which is a minimum school year, and block out 10 more days that no material can be taught. And I'd like to s some way approach this so that, that uh, we wouldn't be cutting out all possibility of anything new being learned and yet accommodate the needs of the people that are going to be uh, missing school that, during those times. I don't know how to do that, but I think that you could come up with a way that we could. Jan? I basically agree with that. I, I don't think there should be any major testing and or the co-curricular <coughs> activities, but I think to rule out any new material um, isn't quite fair to to the kids who are there. 
and i would like to see it done in a way that that ensures that the kids have a time that they can get help with the new material that that might have been presented but i don't think it should be not taught i would agree what i like about loretta's points whereas it puts the responsibility on the student to at least notify the teacher that there is a holiday coming up or at least remind them if if we've done that already in their paychecks or whatever that there's a holiday coming up and that uh... if there is new material that's going to be provided uh... at least to get that up front and set a time up afterwards to uh, to go over any comments from uh... either administrators or other people in the audience with respect to this issue Fran, would you please would, would you could you go to the microphone <laughs> and uh, would you just state uh, your name and your any past affiliation you might have with this organization? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Fran Haywood, and as all of you know, I was a member of the school board. Um, I have a couple of comments about this uh, request. I think in this community we have had a long-standing tradition of encouraging the greatest respect for family commitments, family traditions, and religious traditions. Um, I think that since there seems to be a problem, and we have a policy that we thought addressed the problem, if the policy is not being adhered to by some or several teachers, that's clearly an administrative shortcoming. That if there are teachers that are giving major tests on major religious holidays and, and not th that are not already included in the school calendar, then I think that our, our administrators need to be directed to make sure that the teachers are aware of it, as Daryl suggested, to educate the teachers when are the holidays coming up and to not schedule debating championships and sports championships and major hourly exams and so on on those days, but to take a whole another population of students that are in school and to guarantee their parents that we will not teach them anything new on this day, this day, this day, this day, I think is <coughs> really, really wrong. To guarantee those students that they will be in school and not be exposed to a new concept, not be taught a new idea, not presented with any new material is really not solving a problem. You're just taking the problem from the shoulders of one person and putting it onto the shoulders of another person. If you would like to look toward a suggestion, why don't we look at two major religious holidays that present a real conflict and a real difficult situation for large numbers of families in our community? And since I think, as we know, the calendar is pretty arbitrarily set, see if there are two days that are major conflict days that we could trade with two other days, which would be easy to put in either the end of the school year or in one of our other vacations that I think we you know, the school calendar is set pretty much because that's the way it's always been set. And maybe when we look at the school calendar next year, this could be taken into account. But I don't think the idea of having no new material presented on four or five days out of the year is, is really um, very fair to any pupil. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fran. Any other members of uh, the public? Yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, with regard to the letter from the, uh, the Jewish Federation, they referred to, I can't find it here in front of, I hear it is 113 Jewish families. What does that translate into in terms of uh, Jewish students in our school system? I don't know. Do you have any idea? Does anybody have any idea? No. Uh, it, it's a, it could be a pretty large number if uh, those were families with, uh, with students in the school system, and therefore we could be talking about a fairly large group. Uh, I was just curious. That doesn't necessarily uh, form an important part of making a decision on this, uh, but obviously there's a difference between one student and a hundred students. Uh, in other words, a fractional percentage and eight percent or fifteen percent, whatever it is. Uh, I approach this, uh, or I see two ways to approach it, and uh, I think it was at the last meeting you referred to the fact that I was a product of the Scarsdale Public Schools. Yes, I did refer to that. And I'm going to volunteer. I think I said that that's why you were so smart. I, <laughs> well, I'm going to voluntarily bring that up uh, 
again. And uh, my recollection is that we simply did not have any school at all on the major religious holidays of the major faiths that were represented in our community. And uh, that is by far my preference. Uh, and I would suggest that Good Friday, uh, Passover, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur would be, and I think that's what Fran was saying uh, or suggesting a minute ago, uh, if we could simply stretch out our school year and have all those days as holidays, that would solve the problem without holding back the students that uh, would be in school but would not be being presented any new materials. Um, if that's not practical for any reason, my second choice would be to tighten up our policy statement uh, a little bit more so and, and differentiate between events which can be, which if they're lost, they're lost forever, such as uh, an athletic event or a debating society uh, uh, meeting or a... And that would be, uh, that would be the criteria. Can you make it up later on or can't you? If you can't, then that should not be, that event should not be scheduled, that test should not be scheduled. Well, those are basically the two ways that I see. And I'm really making my decision as we, uh, you know, in this deliberation. Well, um, I guess, the first thing we should do is to assure the administrators that we're not going to, uh, Daryl and the others, that we're not going to change the school calendar tonight. <laughs> so you can relax. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, uh, there are some problems. My, my, first, I want to give my view and then make a suggestion and see what, what you all think of it. I think there are uh, some real problems in solving it uh, the way that uh, Peter and Fran have not suggested we solve it, but have us consider. Uh, the problems I see are that uh, you're just putting more isolated holidays in the school calendar and it just breaks up what already is a fractionated school year. and. Uh, there's just less continuity, and I, frankly, I'd, I think I would rather have uh, the kids in school reading books, reviewing things that they have already done, uh, doing remedial tasks, uh, and having teachers work with students that happen to be there that day than uh, to say, uh, everybody go home, and uh, when it's somebody else's religious holiday, then the other kids play ball. Uh, so, so I have I have a bit of problem about that, but you all are pretty persuasive uh, with respect to your views. Uh, frankly, I would like to see us. Uh, my, my own personal preference is to do just uh, what they want, uh, what the what, what the request is, and that's to isolate the two. Let's say the two most important high holy days and say you don't have to worry, your child is not going to miss something because your child is observing a religious holiday. Uh, just like Easter happens to fall on Sunday, but uh, uh, just like Christmas. There are kids in the school district who don't, who, 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 who are not Christians and then therefore do not observe Christmas, uh, but they, they don't go to school and none of the Christian kids uh, miss anything on that day either. And I just think that, that we ought to have a couple of days. Uh, frankly, I'd like to see this resolved and reconciled in a way that accommodates everybody. And I think it, it begs of that kind of sit down and let's talk about it. And I, I, I would like to suggest, Superintendent, that you and whatever school board members I can get to volunteer uh, spend uh, uh, some time with, uh, with uh, Lisa Cohen, who is the vice president of the, of the Federation, and uh, who's one of the people I know who has been concerned about this, and, uh, and see what we can work out, understanding that we want to accommodate 
the religious issue and at the same time uh, try to maximize the educational activities that we conduct here during the school year. I think the school board has, that's what I hear the school board saying, is that they are sympathetic to this request and they want to accommodate this request, but they want to do it in the way that not only accommodates the request, but maximizes uh, the educational opportunities uh, and you know the time in which we're delivering education out here. Is that correct? Well, I don't, I'm not sure what that means. Are you accepting the uh, that there be a criteria, for example, such as uh, can the material be made up subsequently or even presented earlier? Yeah, I, 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 I am. I'm not being specific at all about it intentionally, because I think you might sit down with representatives of the federation who have written this letter and say, okay, now let's talk about this. Here are some ways that we could do this. What's wrong with this? You know, what's good about it or what's wrong with it? But we're not having that opportunity right now because we're just talking amongst ourselves. And I think there ought to be uh, some give and take on this with the people who wrote the letter. Are, are there any representatives here of the, the Federation or the community? No. There, 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 there aren't. So, Peter, what I'm suggesting is that take place before the next school board meeting and report back to us. Okay. I, I think we have to be a little careful because it, it also includes, for example, Good Friday and, and, and so forth that if we're going to sit down with a group, we better include representatives from... Why? I think Good, Good Friday is not an issue. It, that that the, the letter, the the letter never raised the issue of Good Friday. I mean, Good we Friday. don't we don't seem to have a problem on Good Friday. There's no school on Good Friday. That's the reason we don't have a problem. Yeah, there, there is. is. There is. Yeah. Oh, I thought I was in Massachusetts for a minute. <laughs> okay. We go to school on Good Friday. Unless it falls during Easter or the big break. Break break? And it's not over Easter. But it's I'm tough sure to keep track of this. New York Stock Exchange doesn't close on Good Friday, Friday either. <laughs> well, and Monday Thursday. Well, I think that's something that you all will have to uh, have to uh, uh, consider. Uh, frankly, I think this is one where we're going to have to have a committee. Daryl and the, and the committee of school board members to meet with representatives of the federation. Uh, you can meet with anybody else that you want other religious denominations if you choose and come back to us with a recommendation and I'm not sure when you come back with a recommendation it's just going to be adopted you know in toto but it will give us some more input in, in making a decision and I think that's what we want the input of a, a cross-section of people and a select committee who yes no I just well you were raising your hand and I was I was just you you probably heard me say who is volunteering for this committee when you <laughs> raise your hand? <laughs> now what, I, what I wanted to say is I, I think the guideline is ineffective. Mm -hmm. and, and the people who have called me, I'm very sympathetic with the problem. I think the problem is dividing families. It's dividing children in the families. I am going to school. I won't miss. I'll get too far behind. You will go to this religious observance. It's part of our family tradition. This is our religion. And, and I'm very sympathetic to the situation. And this does not. This is not solving the problem. This this guideline. And so I think, rather than putting this in the packet, it needs to be revised and something effective that that will will uh, address um, the problem that we're facing here. Well, it won't be. But now I'm suggesting that it not be revised until this committee meets, that it gets the information, it reports back to the school board, and the administration then has the views of the committee through the school board. And the school board's views then in, on top of that and then you can revise something and bring it back to us and we've got to do all of that before uh, before uh, December okay right now That's if I understand if I, as I understand this yeah. uh, subcommittee of the board is going to meet with the federation people yeah and then give us their here's what it's just a, just a just a little session to kind of give give and take here what the concerns of the school board are and how uh, the representatives of the federation can help us <coughs> achieve what we're trying to achieve educationally and at the same time accommodate their needs. And I think 
you know, and these kinds of things, everybody gives a little, and, and I think you'll come out to some kind of middle ground that makes sense. Unfortunately, we're negotiating with ourselves right now. I don't call this a negotiation, but unfortunately. Deliberating. Deliberating amongst ourselves now, okay? Well, we're, I'll be more than happy to take the input from the committee and then bring it to the administrative group and write something up and bring it back. I think, I personally think I know what they like. Yeah, but I'm personally not sure that with. every member of the school board agrees with you. But wouldn't but it be he simpler? Met with them, I don't know what. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be simpler if, if Daryl feels that he could write something up that, that would meet the needs to let him do that and bring it back to us and we can submit it to the Jewish Federation and whoever else and instead of forming a committee? No, because I think we're going to have this identical discussion when he comes back next time. And I, we've had our discussion at this date. We're going to have the same discussion. You're all going to say the same things you just said. And what I'd like to see is whether some compromise position can, be, can, can come out of all of this. He said one thing, and you all have said another thing. Daryl said one thing, you said another thing. So let's try to see whether we can sit down outside this room and resolve it first and then come back. Anyway, we're going to see whether this works. Who would like to be on this committee? John? I'd be more than happy. Loretta? Okay. Uh, would you call, uh, get a hold of John and Loretta, and then uh, find out from the Federation with Elisa or whoever can come out to your office and have a nice chat about this and let's see where, where we go with it. I think you ought to meet the same people I met with. Share your concerns and we'll take it to the council and write something up. Okay. So if you want to meet with Lisa Cohen and Jane Zimmerman, I think they represent the group very well. Great. And you'll be there? I'll be happy to be there. And you'll, right. write, you'll write up. Right. And then I'll take your input and theirs, Perfect. write it up, take it to the administrative council to make sure it's feasible, bring it back to the board, December, the second Tuesday in December. Do you have that, Betty? Yeah. In the minutes? Good. All right. We're all set. We're going to move on to the uh, next item on the agenda, Carol. Right. We're going to talk tonight a little bit about whole language. And as you know, a number of our teachers have worked this summer on this. And this is being piloted at the present time. And uh, in as much it's, as it's a major dimension of what we plan to do and are doing, I'd hope that we'd schedule a very sophisticated workshop with the board uh, later on in the year, uh, just the way we have about testing. I think this is equally as important. However, I wanted you to get some feeling for this and the summer work and the principals here tonight, Barbara Powers, to give us a short report. I, and Barbara, could I ask that you begin by assuming that a lot of people watching on television, some people in the audience, maybe even one or two of us up here, need a layman's, a short layman's explanation of what whole language is and what we're doing in Cape Elizabeth schools about it, as though you were talking to some people that weren't expert at the beginning. Okay, I'll do my, I'll do my best. Job. First of all, I would have run up five minutes ago to just ask for one other piece in your deliberations around the holiday issue um, um, that's come to my attention a couple years in a row, and that is the issue of whether or not we must legally cite uh, absences around Jewish holiday as absences from school. And folks have taken offense that it's listed in our permanent records as absent from school. So if you could add that. I don't know if there's a state law on that, right. Daryl, you know, requiring us to report it, but I'd like some help with that one. Okay. Okay. Um, whole language uh, can easily be taken as, as sort of a trendy term. And I think we have to be careful that it doesn't sound like going off in yet another direction that, that is uh, uh, superfluous to our intent as a school. I think that the best way to think about whole language is, is that of teaching reading and all of language arts in the most natural ways possible and getting away from commercial materials. It's an eclectic approach to teaching reading. It involves all different experiences with print, from writing experiences to language experiences to a variety of reading sources. It does no, it, it rejects the notion of needing to teach children to read through controlled vocabulary pieces and very, very much is a whole to part 
approach to reading instruction versus the more commercial products that public education has gotten into since the 40s, where it's very much a breaking down of skills, starting with the small, starting with the letter sounds, working to the to word sounds, putting words together phonically, putting them then into sentences, and then finally into meaningful print. Sort of starts in the other direction, in a very much a way that a parent would work with a child in terms of reading to them um, from infancy on, and, and trying to um, interest a child in print through the, through the nature of the story, through the plot, through the interest in gaining meaning from print. Um, it's just sort of a different philo philosophy in looking at the way we believe children learn. A piece of our whole philosophy at Pond Cove in terms of meeting children's needs as they exist is looking at reading as more a natural progression and not something that needs to be imposed on them with the use of commercial materials. Now we're certainly not at the point yet of rejecting commercial materials entirely and certainly there are very legitimate strategies to use with basils. But what we're saying is we'd very much like to explore the world of true literature and, and make those reading writing connections that, that help children learn to read so very much. I think that when we sit down in workshop in November, we, which we'd like to invite you to, kind of a dual topic workshop Daryl and I have talked about, whole language would be one of those pieces. And thinking about it in terms as a reading strategy versus this package uh, deal is, is a more appropriate way of looking at whole language. Harold, if that's helpful at all. That is helpful. Um, uh, therefore, what I'd like to do tonight is just talk to you in brief about our summer work and know that we'd like to go into tremendous detail later in November and place before you some of the documents that were developed that really do outline succinctly the work that happened this summer, which I can only describe as, as truly a phenomenal piece of work that was done by these folks and have, have given us the real confidence we needed to set forth. Um, you do need to understand a couple of things. First of all, um, whole language strategies are being piloted in um, nine classrooms, one, two, and three in all of kindergarten. That doesn't mean that other classrooms are rejecting whole language strategies. In fact, it's very much a part of all of our classrooms. It's just that the people who are piloting have um, ended their use of basal materials with the exception of a few learners. Once again, you don't reject any strategy in whole language. You don't reject phonics. You don't reject basal. You simply better identify what helps a particular child in their learning needs. So in the pilot classrooms, those are the teachers who participated in the summer work. They needed to be ready to go. And a couple of special education teachers attended all four weeks as well. Given the fact that we needed to be able to start this in September, we had three major objectives this summer. The first one was sort of starting at the beginning, the definition and articulation of what literacy is at different stages of reading rather than as grade level equivalencies. We've talked about that a lot in terms of defining kids around a reading level. Are they in the 2-2 book or the 3-1 or the 1-2? totally getting away from that notion and looking at individual children going through stages of literacy. Um, we drew upon the Nova Scotia curriculum quite significantly, a lot of good whole language work going on in Canada. Um, work from summer clinics that have been held at Orono, and we used Phyllis Brzee uh, quite a bit in consultation last year, and she um, has been of uh, tremendous assistance to us. She's up at Orono. The Rockport School District has done a lot of work in whole language, and we used some of their materials as well. But synthesizing all of this work together, and as a school, we came up with a conclusion that we'd like to look at reading in terms of early, transitional, and independent literacy. Um, these are all definable stages in a child's development with print, and it has to do with uh, print concepts, reading strategies, comprehension, uh, writing and library skills. Um, they're not tied to grade levels, but rather based on the individual child's development. That means in a given classroom, all three stages of literacy will indeed be present in a primary school setting. And, and that child will simply go through a more traditional graded school as we may appear to be, but be in wide um, range of development that they bring to their teacher, excuse me. Um, Okay, the child's particular growth as a reader will be documented and strategies developed individually within the group of children present in the classroom. 
um, again, we'll talk about this in greater detail at the workshop and we'll shine, uh, share some of the defining behavioral statements um, that have to do with our recognition of a child's development through these um, stages. Our second goal was then clearly ways of record keeping and assessment. You need to understand that once we no longer use the commercial basal materials, we also lose that anchor that's called assessment and record keeping. We needed to replace that with something that made sense, both in terms of the child, the teacher being able to keep on track of the child's progress, but also being able to share with parents um, how the child is progressing through material. Given that, we've, we've sort of identified a series of anchors. We do hope to work on uh, some uh, curriculum-based assessment documents through some tie-in with actual use of literature. Um, miscue analysis is a really important feature of our program where teachers are learning ways to listen to children read, um, watch their miscues or error patterns, and therefore be able to, to uh, zero in on any kinds of strategy problems for the child. Um, Documenting kids, uh, the kids' work progress as realized by the teacher and explained to the parents will be in the form of writing samples, reading logs, uh, the taping of oral read, of reading uh, throughout the year so a, a parent could listen to their child read in September and then once again in May, uh, make some comparisons, conferencing to check comprehension. Those are some of the evidences that are going to be developed and used this year to be able to watch progress. Um, and we plan to, for now, we have a language arts curriculum, but we plan to, for now, compare the progress in reading skills to the scope defined in the basal. So we're not turning our back to that whole notion of really watching skill development. We're not going to look at sequence. That's not of issue in this particular progr program, but scope, which is the breadth of the skills that are anticipated at different levels. To be sure, we're not letting go of that anchor too much yet. Our third goal was to develop then literature-based materials for both cross-curricular and literature themes. That means that trying to develop programs that have some strength throughout, throughout the uh, purchasing of titles that are all by similar authors, similar genre, um, being able to have kids in reading groups around interest areas by purchasing multiple titles, Decisions came about beefing up classroom libraries and adding more copies of the multiple title piece. We've had major, major shelving built into Susan Welch. Oh, excuse me, what's a mul I don't understand multiple title? Is. Multiple title, Harold, would be a decision that a particular book would be of interest to some second and third graders and buying 10 or 12 copies of it so a group of children can read it together and discuss it. That's all multiple titles is, is taking a, a quality title and buying several copies. Okay. Um, with that came the need to negotiate the various positioning of some of the <coughs> authors and titles because every teacher develops their favorites and we found some redundancy in themes, in use of particular authors, and that negotiation took some, some uh, skill for Susan for first grade teachers to say, okay, okay, we won't touch X, and the second grade teachers to say, yeah, we'd really like to protect this for being a fresh piece in second grade, and, and on up through. So we really now have some protected pieces in first, second, and third grade so the children will have for sure, fresh material. There's a lot to be said for repeat of some material, but you also like to do fresh work too with particular authors and themes. Part of what we did is identify some presenters to come in and work with us. Uh, Donna Maxim came down from the Booth Bay Public Schools and talked, spent a, spent a morning talking about room organization and management plus record keeping strategies. This is a whole new deal in terms of managing a room. And again, we can go into terrific, as much detail as you want later on. Libby Cohen came in from the university. She's the person that's offering us a research vehicle for development of curriculum-based assessment. We're going to sort of piggyback with a district in Chelsea who's also developing some curriculum-based assessment. And we need to be selecting a piece of literature soon that we're going to use to start establish some baselines for comprehension and other purposes. Sue Safer came in, a course person on our own staff, and did a piece on language connections for the language disabled learner ways of monitoring their needs and connecting strategies to whole language. And then Ted DeMille, who's on our staff, along with Sue Welch, did a whole MISQ workshop, MISQ analysis workshop for the teachers so that they themselves could sit down with children. What's a MISQ analysis? That's, that's the piece I spoke to very briefly, Harold, where you give a child a piece of literature to read orally. And there's a way of being able to take notes as they read that, that watch for error patterns. Okay. And it, and it teaches you an awful lot to a skilled observer, just where it is there's any breakdown or strengths, okay? Um, future reporting. 
on the on our next workshop day which is october nineteenth sue and the committee will be giving a full report to the rest of the staff and we'll have these documents available for their review at that time we're asking for some work chop time with you in november if that's convenient we're proposing a workshop a joint workshop with the middle school in december where we'll do some initial presentation around whole language to the staff at that time and sue and nancy hutton are already planning a course for next summer thank you very much any questions um it won't be a surprise as a question um i'm just curious right now for the kids that are in the pilot programs are there specific sheets for each child as far as keeping track of where they're at and what they know and what they need help with yes that's the piece that um, needed to be developed this summer jan and right. and in fact it's there and we know it'll probably undergo a few modifications before we have it where we'd like it to be mm -hmm. but yes that monitoring has begun and and will be talked about language arts committee meets every other week and that's their constant agenda michael efron was able to join us at our last one to listen to really how basic the discussion is right now in terms of monitoring this program mm -hmm. uh, one other question and that is that um some parents have expressed a concern to me that that once the switch is made to whole language that the basil is going to go out the window and that it's not going to be used at all and and there are some people that feel strongly that there's still room for some basal work too and some children benefit from that. I think you could put some minds at ease if you could address that for us. Absolutely. And once again, when you're looking at learning styles with children, that child who, who learns best in a real sequential presentation of material and skills uh, is very much supported by basal work. Um, we're finding though through research in our own experience that about 75% of the kids do better in a more global uh, all around look that that notion of drawing meaning from print by immersing themselves in print but certainly we have not only putting the minds of ease at parents who find some value in that we have major investment in basal textbooks there are nice literature pieces within the basal textbooks and teachers who have experienced them now know which ones are especially helpful for children and, and, and can extend easily so yes and particularly for those learners who do better with that kind of presentation of material. That's the whole point of this, is to reject nothing and to use what works best for any kid. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. As they go through this process, as years go by, they're gonna still be taking the main assessment test and mm -hmm. whether we agree or don't agree that that's a good mm -hmm. way of assessing your reading abilities. Mm -hmm. How do you perceive that? Do you, I'm, do you see that softening or do you I'm see more comfortable with the main assessments, Loretta, than I am with the SRAs for this reason. They are asked to um, describe comprehension based on short and long passages. They're asked to read material and respond. The SRA has none of that. It's really just a much more skills-oriented piece. So we're far more comfortable with the main assessments in terms of measuring what we value. We also have both Sue and Nancy on the state committee that develops the language arts portion of the main assessment. And there's a lot of, of whole language schools represented on that committee. The other piece they're looking at um, as a parent who panicked over fourth grade scores in reading comprehension is even looking at the notion of the need to possibly do partial scoring for a child who picks a second best answer. The difference between picking the best answer and picking one that's absolutely nonsensical is zero. You know, if you get it wrong, you get it wrong. And there's really uh, a feeling amongst the committee that, boy, that's, that's not how we're teaching reading strategies these days. You're supposed to think, you're supposed to wrestle with material, and we ought to be giving some credit for the child who tries and isn't way off base. So they seem to be real sensitive to that whole piece. And then having, of course, the writing portion of the exam is brand new to us over what the SRAs used to offer. So it frankly assesses more what we value. Will you do away with the SRAs? I don't know. Are you hoping to do that? I don't know. I'd, I'd like us to really explore this curriculum-based assessment piece. It's very interesting to me. If we can, as a school, say this is what we value, let's find something that'll give us the same kind of feedback and information we've previously gotten from standardized tests, we'll need to look at that. But we're not there yet. I don't want to speak to that, Mr. Chairman. I have spoken with Michael about that. As we uh, close in on the curriculum work, it's extremely important that Michael be very close to that testing committee. 
and uh, there are possibilities that would change the testing very drastically. The main assessment we always have to. But uh, he's very cognizant of uh, how important it is that he be on that committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only the SRAs, we may uh, choose a wide number of things that we'd like to use rather than the SRA. Mm -hmm. But the assessment naturally we'll keep because we have to. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just bring up one other point. Uh, and this is a question, Barbara. It appears to me on the record keeping that uh, you're sort of uh, in, not inventing, but developing your own Bergantz that uh, are similar to a Bergantz system. And this is one that uh, was published some time ago where uh, three pages and 20 minutes with a teacher go down to a series of concepts and come up with a sort of a profile. We'll be developing our own, I gather, is the and have. And have. and have that's a big piece of what right. we'd like to share with you. It's, it's more it's it's more of a long-term project than a than a 20 minutes with a teacher develop a profile thing, Daryl. But it, that's the point to be able to really stay on top of our assessment of children. And and since we've lost that other anchor, to be able to document that nicely. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask the second question: Is uh, that when that document is developed and finished, uh, is that portable? Could we sell that to Falmouth? It's, it's, to, to tell you the truth, I have said to Susan Welch, the, the, the things that have been developed this summer, I think we should inquire about copyright. Now, we have um, obviously used some ideas from other sources and would need to get some clearances, but I think it's absolutely top quality. And one of the reasons we're so proud of it is a piece we've spent the last two years doing is scouring conferences across this country for record keeping and assessment stuff to go along with whole language. A lot of systems jumped into it without having this piece done. And we simply wouldn't do that. And now that we have a piece that we're going to be work I mean, let us work on it this year and kind of get the bugs out routine. But I think it's spectacular stuff. And it's really, it's really cutting edge kinds of material. Can, can I ask a couple of questions for, I hope, for the elucidation of the listening audience, some of whom are as uh, unsophisticated in the technical aspects of education as I am. And here I go again, Bob. Okay, all right. <laughs> Brace yourself. <laughs> uh, I just two or three quick questions. But how did the Cape Elizabeth school system? Uh, how did we decide, how did the teachers and the administration decide that this is what the direction that we should go? Was it a series of articles? Was it people attending uh, courses? Or, uh, what is it that caused this to spring up in Cape Elizabeth and maybe not spring up in some other communities this year? It's, that's not a brief question, but I'll do my best. It's, it's funny because we, and part of our curriculum committee work have been talking about the process of change and what works, what makes things happen in a school. And a whole lot of things came together at, at one time in our school. For one, um, our staff has always absolutely valued professional development. It is constantly, talk about the lifelong learner mode, constantly out reading, pulling in information, attending conferences, and, and the whole notion of bringing some more um, natural approaches to the teaching of reading uh, really started raising its head four and five years ago. Along with that was coupled with our emphasis on writing and that writing process piece. If you remember when Susan and Nancy and Mary were first hired, it was really for that writing piece. Um, and since they began investigating and supporting that process, the whole reading-writing connection has raised its head as saying, wow, this is an unbelievable way to teach early uh, reading, early learners. Um, about the same time when some excitement was being generated around this process and folks were getting out and hearing about this whole language, which in, in fact originated in New Zealand and quickly exported to Canada, um, Susan went off for her master's program at Wheelock in Boston, which is a, which is a, a very, very excellent school with a graduate program in reading instruction. And this was being highly promoted as uh, a philosophy that made a lot of sense for a lot of learners. And when she came back from that graduate experience and was able to talk to the teachers about some of the things she'd learned, um, there was great excitement generated. 
keep in mind that it was at that, about that same time that we were having to retain so many first graders because they were having difficulty with first grade materials and yet we had no instructional um, strategies that were allowing young learners to, to do well. We were frustrated about that. This whole approach to reading started to say to us, is this a way to appeal to young learners and, and meet them um, according to their own needs? It's, it's, uh, it was research-based. It was being touted in the international reading community. It was really one of those approaches that said, reject nothing and think about it all. Um, the question for, for those of you at home was, was if, it's, if it's come from New Zealand and Canada and, and other places in the world, why is it we had so much work to do? We truly investigated all of that and we didn't find anything we were satisfied with. Um, one thing I respect about Susan is she's a, she's a good break for me. She's, she's a very cautious person and while we were dealing with Yarmouth and some other districts and Wyndham and Scarborough who had really jumped into this with both feet, Susan was saying, hold on, we've got to be very careful that we don't lose the, the terrific um, ability we have to chart kids' progress before we jump too fast and that's why in our fourth year we're finally piloting. Um, we did write away from materials from kids. There was actually a whole language conference in New Zealand last summer but we didn't quite dare ask for <laughs> to send three or four teachers at $3,000 a piece to New Zealand. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's there, I'm not sure, but the local districts who we have networked with had not come up with any documents that we were comfortable with. Teachers were going a little more on intuition and, they're, and they know how the child is doing, et cetera, et cetera, and, and we've just um, always wanted to be a lot more clear about that and some of my friends who teach in Scarborough and other places probably be angry that I said that but that's clearly what's been expressed to me by teachers in other districts too is they they jumped into something and then have sort of had to backpedal for a couple of years when oh yes and and in f we just had the New England Reading Association conference in Portland last weekend and it was absolutely the main issue um, it was the main issue at ASCD when I attended New Orleans conference a year ago, March. It truly is a national movement. And, and I do worry when I see articles like we're in the Telegram a week ago where a school decided that this straight phonics approach was the way they wanted to go and, and made it sound like whole language rejected phonics. Not the case. It simply has a, a, a piece. Mm -hmm. uh we're going to have a workshop on this, and this would be a, that will be an opportunity for us and any members of the public who wish to come to this workshop. That's right. Uh, right. To hear about it and discuss it. I think it will um, really help you to have the documents before you yeah. too. Yeah. Well, I would ask in, in that connection. Uh, first of all, let me say I want to say this. You know, uh, make this positive statement because sometimes I'm misunderstood when I ask critical questions, but. Um, I, I really appreciate all the work that all of you have done. You're doing it because you think that it will lead to a better system of education and you think it will help the young people in this system. That's the only reason you're doing it and you've doing, done a lot of work and I compliment you for reaching out and uh, expanding your own horizons and, and, and expanding the horizons of, of uh, the teachers. I mean, we're really uh, doing something worthwhile. The other side, I, w I want to tell you that in my six years around here, uh, I guess I've learned to fear the word pilot more than any other word. <laughs> the only other word that I fear almost as much is the research says, <laughs> and or the phrase. And so uh, I hope that you will present to us, Mr. Superintendent and Principal, the the pros and the cons, because mm -hmm. I'm sure that pretty soon some people are going to write some things that say, hey, wait a minute, mm -hmm. there's some problems with this. There has never been an exper experiment in any field which has been without problems. There will be problems mm -hmm. with this. Mm -hmm. And what I want to make, I'm speaking only for myself, but I hope you will address this in the workshop as well, that 
we've had a lot of experiments in education, uh, particularly since World War II. Some of them have worked and continue to be used and they've been worthwhile. Others haven't worked, but they still continue to be used for long periods of time. So I hope you will be able to address how we're going to monitor our experiment. It's an experiment. And I, I, I hope, I won't be on the school board then, but I hope that the people who are here who will be on the school board will have a way of keeping on top of this and putting the brakes on if there are problems sooner rather than later, that's all. Because you know, it won't be the, you know, I think this is gonna work, but there have been things we've tried that haven't worked. We agree with that. There's also been things that have been tried too quickly and discarded too quickly for lack of understanding and support. And I'd sure. like to bring along to an article I found recently simply entitled, Why Education Innovation Fails Sometimes. And it's a kind of a recognition of the time factor too. Sure. But you're right, we, that's why the monitoring process is critical and that's why this, this is true pilot. This is monitoring. Uh, Barbara, we gave open classrooms a good chance. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Harold, the one nice thing that this has given us in the pilot rooms, which speaks dear to your heart, and I know other people's on the board, is that these classrooms are fully heterogeneously placed. Kids are not made aware daily about who's a bluebird and who's a robin, and it makes for a very wonderful classroom dynamic. Yeah, that does, okay. please. All right. Uh, we're going to have, should we select a date? for You're going to get back to us on I'll the date. I'll get back to you. And, and I think somehow we are members of the public who are interested in this issue uh, we ought to find some means to let the public know when that workshop takes place. I should have mentioned that we would plan to do a major parent presentation um, sometime after the New Year so that we can share all of this with them at that point, too. Okay. Great. This would be another opportunity to can uh, some of our workshop material so that we could use it. Now that we have the channel, you see, we can educate the parents in the community very easily. And I'd like to just say, rest assured, that we're not changing here just for the sake of change. We're watching this very, very carefully. Also, I, I don't think anybody should have the impression that, that it's a new program. It's a new program for Cape Elizabeth, mm -hmm. but the work in New Zealand with Sylvia Ashton Warner started many years ago, mm -hmm. and it's just new to, to us. Barbara? Mm -hmm. Fine. Thank you, Thank you okay. Barbara. All right, Mr. Oh. Superintendent, we're now uh, yes. ready for your report on building projects. Going from the curriculum to bricks and mortar, I'm very pleased. Uh, here is the report on the building projects that were budgeted at the high school. The uh, other two schools will be presented to you in December. And Dee has uh, outlined them, and I'll ask him to uh, probably say a few words about them. Well, this is just a list of uh, approved projects that uh, went through the 88-89 budget process. And if you have any questions, strictly at the high school. You notice that the roof did come in like at 25% above the projected amount. However, we are saving dollars in other areas, so that account should be all right. Mr. Chairman, I'd suggest a uh, suggestion that uh, for your meeting of uh, uh, I'm looking for it. For your meeting with the council, yeah. I'd suggest that uh, right. the business manager compile all of the projects and have that ready for that evening because of their deep concern for our uh, spending on capital projects. I think that's a very good idea. It may also, you know, you might also want to consider making available to the council the opportunity to take a guided tour through these facilities so that they can, uh, they see can the see work. the state of the schools in the town. Is that the principal reason for the meeting? On the request was an informal meeting. They generally have two a year, one prior to budget and one a long ways from budget. And uh, I think the words that were used uh, is they'd like to get to know you uh, in as much as their council is kind of new and our board's new. I, I think that's the real purpose. 
However, they, they're they always checking on what we do about capital projects. So this is one time we've done it. Uh, I, I, this fits under bricks and mortar. It's sort of a stretch. But the space picket fence skirting that you have around the new portable building, yeah. well, how are we going to keep the snow out? Of that this winter we're proposing to either put a plastic around that for the winter or put some type of a board where we could reuse them every year just screw them in type thing take them off in the spring just to stop the air from getting in there because it could you know would eliminate the uh, a lot of the uh, coldness underneath it's, it would seem like it could we be will a do something yeah okay, thanks. it was suggested that we put a on the inside of the grate that we put a flapper goes up in the spring and down in the winter, which would be very simple once it's installed. We could do that ourselves. We need to keep the snow out. Yeah, we do need to keep the snow out. Oh, yes. All right, now while you're on buildings, you, last time you, I just, we need to have a little bit of a progress report. The last time we met in September, you were going to get together with an architect and with this athletic director and others to figure out what to do about the track storage building. Right. Is progress being made? Yes, I have a report on that this evening. It's uh, <laughs> I'll continue while I report on that. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for where it is. It's F. It's F. Okay. When I get to F. So if I can continue, the next one is the building project roofs. Yeah. Now there's a full report in your backup material on the roof situation. Basically, it's a lengthy document, but basically the bids came in about 100% higher than we had anticipated. <laughs> However, with an architect, we made some very major structural changes in the roof that had to be dealt with. Now, I'm inclined to agree with all the discussions we've had, and there's been many, that the way to do this is to do a portion of the roof that will not disturb the students in this budget which means ordering the supplies, doing some of the work during vacations, the structural work, and then have the contractor do it in six weeks in the summer when it doesn't affect the children. Now, we budgeted approximately, and Dee can correct me on that, $74,000. We would expand a good amount of that. Then, when school is out, the architect, and you'll note there's a letter from the builder, rather, that he would keep its price where it is, and he would do it in approximately four to six weeks. And that way we'd get the job done correctly, and uh, we wouldn't have to worry about that wing for a long time. Any comments on that? No, can we wait that long without having an uncomfortable situation in the, in the school? Yes, he says he can, and uh, there won't be any noise. The only time they're making any noise when doing structural work will be during the Christmas, on February, Christmas, February and, East, and April. April. The roof is structurally sound. It leaks. So we're gonna, in the meantime, we're going to do something with plastic or anything to try to get the water to flow in certain designated areas away from the equipment. See, the main thing there is the shop area where you have electric motors and stuff, saws and that. Well, is it a hazard if we wait till the spring? I guess that's my question. If we wait till summer to finish the roof, are we making, or do we have a hazardous situation? The only hazard that we've been told is that the, the water leaks on the equipment while it's going. I've written a memo to the principal and the industrial arts teacher. If there's any water coming down after we funnel it away, then not to use the equipment at that time. That's our only concern, and we'll watch it carefully. Any other questions on this, ma'am? Moving along, Darrell. This is the memo I have sent out. I don't think you need to know the administrative memos. If you want to read it, I'll be more than happy to pass it in. Now, this is an answer to the chairman's request. This is the report on the storage building. Now, superintendent, the controller, the director of athletics, Gary Spencer, the builder, and the architect worked last week on a 20 by 40 storage building. We're presently getting the estimates for the building and the architect is rechecking the location that we've selected. Now, the selection has been only because there aren't that many choices. The selection is as you approach the gate, looking at the bowl, where you go in to run around the track. On the left, 
in that hollow is where we in, would, would suggest we put this 20 by 40 building. Where the track curves. Right. Yeah. It'll go into the building. It'll go into the plant yeah. or the bank. Yeah. It'll probably be concrete yeah. for a lot of reasons. Now, when the architect comes with any real material, we'll call Peter Leslie, who's on the committee. Mm -hmm. And that committee will come up with some fine tuning, come back to the board, and make a concrete suggestion. The criteria for this is to put the building where we can, based on the building inspector's criteria, which is setbacks and all that sort of thing, and to put it so that you don't have to carry all that stuff a great length of time. Place. In other words, if you put it behind the school, you have to take all those hurdles and all this sort of thing. Also, it's the feeling of the AD director that uh, 20 by 40 would be ample for all of our equipment. You know the mats that you see out on occasion? All that sort of thing. Everything would be in there. Hey, Darrell, with respect to your second criteria, uh, uh, frankly, I would hope that if you're given a choice between putting it in a place that screws up visibility for people that are there watching games, or the alternative being someplace where you have to get a two-foot variance or something like that, I would hope you'd come back and discuss it with us so we could decide whether to go for the variance. Certainly. We even talked about getting a golf cart. You know, a golf cart with a uh, little trailer in the back and putting it somewhere else if that were feasible. But no, no, where the aesthetics will come very high in, in the criteria. Sure. Well, you have good taste, so I have no problem with that. <clears throat> okay, is that a complete? Uh, what about the coffees? Right. Coffee committee. We have coffee a report. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The coffees are set for November 7th, 9th, and 10th because the school board meets Tuesday the 8th. Um, and if any citizen in the community would be willing to host a coffee in their home for the school board, whether it be their neighbors or uh, grade level or whatever, uh, we would be happy to come, all of us or a few or however you want to do it, and spend the evening answering questions and, and hearing your comments. So please call the superintendent's office if you would like to host a coffee. Uh, we have a problem with the school board, uh, incidentally, on the 8th, because that is election day. Right. So we ought not to have a school board meeting on election day. Great. I mean, there's a lot of commotion around here. They're counting votes and everything else. No, I'm here anymore. We were with the, we were with the high school. Well. <laughs> <laughs> We, this has been an issue before the school board, and if it's the school board's wish that we meet on election day, we will meet on election day. Uh, maybe we ought to, uh, I think we'll reserve that to the end of this meeting. Uh, but uh, in, in the, the dates for the coffees are now what? The, the seventh? 7th, the 9th, and the 10th. That's a Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They can be daytime or evening. Okay. Uh, anything else to report uh, with respect to the copies other than the dates? Do you know where they're going to be? No, I was just saying that yeah. people can call and volunteer to host one. Okay. Uh, the next item, Daryl, I believe is you have a yes. announcement of a retirement. No, unless you want to. Do away with oh, excuse the me. Goals, and goals and objectives. Goals and objectives. Something uh, we that's don't. That's a very. I'll do that very briefly. First, uh, our curriculum model. Uh, Dr. Ephraim is working presently with the principals and a committee, teachers. The math workshops are well on their way. Uh, I've met. Uh, we've all met for hours with uh, our math consultant, and I'm very pleased with what's happened there. I expect that we will in December or probably in November present a curricular model to you that uh, we hope to use to uh, make very certain that we're, our, our materials, our sequence, our scope and sequence are up to par. And Michael's working on that presently. The second was to develop a building and space need solution. I'm pleased to say that the Administrative Council each month works on a particular 
solution or alternative to the building program. I would hope that after five meetings, uh, we would report two or three alternative solutions uh, to the building program here. Uh, what we do is we do an hour's work and then all the principals do all of the leg work in terms of the demography and what have you. Uh, just to give you some feeling for uh, what we're working on this month is uh, we are uh, recommending in this alternative solution the uh, development of eight classrooms in the industrial, art, industrial arts wing of the middle school where there's music, industrial arts, and band. And uh, those eight classes would take our population for, I think, six years. In turn, we would move to the bus garage, complete refurbishment, and I have an architect working on that presently, for industrial arts, music, band, and all of the kinds of things that make noise with a small satellite cafeteria. Now, that's one model we're examining very carefully. Uh, we'll bring you the pros and the cons of the whole thing and the costs and uh, where it rates in our uh, recommendations. So that's just a, some, to give you some feeling for how we're going about this. Uh, we'll also naturally uh, detail everything that's been done by the council, you know, the, the New England School Development Council. But uh, we're hopeful to be probably a little more creative on some other things. Uh, the next thing was the performance of all students. Here's where we are presently in this. Uh, we're presently doing two things. We're looking at the essential schools uh, coalition. Can, 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 can I just for the for the folks that are watching, right. who are not privy to all our discussions, the goal the goal and objective that uh, the superintendent is talking about regarding performance of all students has to do with the feeling of the school board that we have got to focus some of our efforts on how to bring up the performance of all students that there is a criticism of uh, schools in general not just these schools but schools in general that there is a lot of effort and resources dedicated to uh, children on both ends of the spectrum in terms of the difficulty they have in learning or the facility with which they learn, but that children who are in the middle are left without that kind of special emphasis. And what do we do about this problem? Now proceed if you would, thanks. No, two things that we're looking at early in this year, uh, the Essential School Coalition, which is a uh, coalition under Ted Sizer at Brown University. As you know, Sizer is the uh, the leading expert on high schools who's written uh, Horace's Compromised and a few other books. Uh, we have the materials at the present time. Naturally, uh, the high school principal is working with the teachers on that. We're hopeful to catch a program in Boston early in December. And at the same time, probably more importantly, the high school principal is taking a hard look at uh, the grouping patterns at the high school. Being new, it will take some time. However, how those have been sliced uh, over the years is very important and uh, we'll get a report on that. So there are two ways uh, we're attacking or attempting to attack, attack the all the performance of all the students. Uh, D, uh, because we're all so new, uh, we've, set a, we've established a series of workshops. Uh, after, as of November we will have had two and I'm certain that we're going to want more as the year goes on. And I'm extremely pleased to see us dealing with the curriculum because we all know it isn't very long we're going to be talking about something else and it's budget. And it appears when we start budgeting, we sort of forget, you know, the real reason why we're all here, and that's the curriculum and the kids. So I'm hopeful we get those workshops out of the way and before budget time. Uh, the leadership team at the Pond Cove School is moving along uh, efficiently. Uh, this is that restructured organization, and I think we should report formally to you every six months on its progress, because this truly is a pilot, and I think probably one of the most significant things we're going to do here in terms of the long pull. Uh, and shortly, we're, we'll be negotiating a new teacher contract. The chairman is aware of that. He's received a letter. The letter has been answered. Uh, we would hope that in three weeks, 
the teachers association would have their proposal to the negotiating committee of the board whoever they are which i believe the chairman is going to handle this evening yeah i think we would talk about uh, uh negotiate we ought to talk about negotiations in executive session and uh, we will be talking about that excellent now the five-year point maintenance program is something with the new uh, business manager started and i'd hope that we would bring uh, some of that material to the council meeting on the 24th wherever it is and uh, those are the goals for the year and we've attacked some of them uh, to a small degree others a little more but we'll be working on those and we'll probably give you a report periodically every six months or so as to where we are okay in that in that respect uh you know this this goal and objective with respect to performance of all students is something that we've been after for a long time and uh, six months I'll just about have completed my sixth year here and I will leave without anything ever having happened I wonder if oh, uh, I it's, wouldn't say oh anything. I think so I wonder if it's uh, possible to set uh, uh, some kind of a target date where we might have a little discussion about about that I, I like it preferably before I leave the school board I was January January would be great high school principals here okay. can we, we put that in the minutes of the meeting that, high school uh, principals nodding his head we could certainly give you a good report by January okay great thank you I'm sorry to do that but you, when you all reach your sixth year here there may be something that you thought about in your first year would like to see discussion of in your final I'm sure that's a standard that we will pick up yeah. as you leave the scene of battle. Right, right. Okay. Uh, any questions of Daryl? If not, we'll move on to the announcement of the retirement. I'd like to uh, present the superintendent recommends that Leona Craig's retirement be accepted by the board. We need a motion for that. Is a motion? Uh, so moved. Motion is made and seconded. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. All opposed? It is accepted with regret, and please convey that to Mrs. Craig. Thank you very much. Put that in the minutes, please. Now, the next item of the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held on September 6. You all have a copy of those minutes. You had an opportunity to review them. Are there any corrections or modifications that you want to make to them? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve those minutes. Someone has written. This motion has been made and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, it's a vote. Uh, we decided uh, at the beginning of the year that we were going to have the verbal report of the business manager on a quarterly basis, that we would get uh, every month the written report, and this is the time for the quarterly report. So, uh, Dee, appreciate it if you would... Uh, Give us an overview. Page, page 11 of your agenda, you will see the revenues for 88-89. To date, as of September 30th, we have received 30% of the revenues, or $2.3 million, or $2.2 million, out of projected 7.7. Any questions on revenues? Page 12 is the expenditure side of the budget, general program. To date, we have expended uh, 1.7 million, or 23% of the budget. 25% in the elementary school, 22% at middle school, 22 at high school, and 24 on distributed. Do yeah, I have a question on that? 25% uh, would be the ideal number for three months, that being one quarter of the year. Uh, but as the months go by, how how does that uh, happen in reality? Is that a number to look at and you can say, well, if it's 25%, we're right on target? No, or does it really. uh, oscillate quite a lot? What happens, okay, it oscillates quite a bit because uh, like July had three payrolls. You'll have three payrolls in December. Uh, what happens to all your supplies for the year I bought and paid for, let's say, by October or November? So starting February, your expenditures start really declining. Because you fix, you know, your payroll, you have to meet, you got to meet uh, your utility bills and stuff like that. Your supplies are mostly all purchased and paid for. So it's hard to say that you look at the at the expenditure side of a budget and say that you should spend 8% uh, a month or whatever it is. 
you know, if, if we don't know that, then these numbers don't really mean anything to us. And I wonder if we might move to and uh, a monthly a monthly budget, which would uh, anticipate precisely those three payrolls in one month, or uh, higher expenses at one time versus another, and then we would be able to tell at each period, and I would suggest that for our purposes, every 90 days is more than enough. Yeah. And then we would know whether we're within the budget or not, but it doesn't seem to me from what you're saying that these numbers are really going to tell us where we are. You get a point there, Peter, because you can't look at this and say that you should spend X amount of dollars every month and, you know, for 12 months. We could come up with something, I guess, where we could identify I don't know. a a uh, monthly or you have a historical perspective you can go back and look what your cash flow your, your 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 cash expenditures look like monthly over a period of time and try to come up with some some standard if we could come up with a model in other words if you took 12 months or 10 months 10 school months then you'd have a model two of the months are going to have three payroll precisely one of the months is going to have when we pay for most of the supplies. One of the months is going to be when we have the biggest oil bill. So if we took a year and developed a model that we all felt was within the budget and was appro approximate, then we could say the model up here is that's stuff to do though. Well, I don't know what, what your Cato well, system see, has, but uh, if you had a software package that tied the budget to your accounting, you would just do your budget and then push a button at the end of each accounting period and it would show a variance. But if you don't have that in your existing system, it would be quite, it might be quite uh, cumbersome and difficult for you to produce that. But, but I've worked with a system in IBM before this job that had a variance and the variance didn't mean a thing because of the way money in schools is spent. In other words, like the supply account, if you appropriate $5,000 in grade two, let's say for supplies, and come October 30th, you spend $4,000, you know, that variance, uh, is, the variance, the machine will spit out a variance that should be on a monthly basis. Take the budget divided by 12 years, your variance. You're right. Uh, I, I think you and I better have lunch or something and, yeah. uh, rather than hold the meeting up on, no, on this. See, the whole budget process is on a yearly basis. I, get yeah. on, I know what you're getting at, but you'd have to, we'd have to sit down and have a base year somewhere so we could get the history behind mm -hmm. this and then. And do what Daryl says is to identify the larger numbers and what months they fall in. But why don't we talk about that yeah, sure. at some point? I'd the following page is your special programs, revenue and expenditures. This will, uh, anticipated revenue will inflate as we go by. As we do, we are applying for more grants and money keeps coming in on a monthly or basis. Food service program on the following page. Uh, for the month of September, that we had a net loss of $8,081. However, for the cash available to date, we still get $943. Startup cost for September is where you buy all your, your food and supplies for the... We normally have a net loss after the startup oh, yeah. month. Is, yep. this an, is this net loss... Uh, uh, in the ballpark for what we've experienced before? Yeah, you'll see it, uh, the figures turn around in January. Okay, so this doesn't concern you? No. Okay. You see, this is a good example of the type of thing that if the budget, or if this were structured and presented in relation to a budget, it would show that you budgeted an $8,000 loss for this month. And we'd say, oh, well, that's expected that's gone. and we yeah. just pass on. As far as community services on the following page, to date, they have collected $114,000 and they spent $85,000. The last report being enrollments. Now, September, October 1st enrollment, along with your April 1st, is what the state uses in calculating the uh, per pupil uh, account for the, for the district. There is one correction, I'm sorry, two corrections. Under middle school, grade fifth, that should be 110 students, or five, and 562 for the total. Under the elementary, under grade, uh, first grade, that should be 130 students, and 502 for the total. And the total this month of 1,533 students. Excuse me, what did you say for the elementary school? Grade what? Grade, first grade. 
florida hundred thirty hours to one twenty nine yeah pick up two kids one in the fifth and one in the first for a district total of fifteen thirty three students as compared to fifteen and thirty nine last year we have a drop of six students with fifty decrease at the high school we have an increase of thirty students at the middle school from last year and we have an increase of fourteen students at the elementary school Mr. Chairman, uh, we'll watch uh, the uh, demography here with great interest because we're working on uh, long-range plans. But one thing I'd like to bring to your attention, there's a commission that made a report recently here in town and uh, came to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, and i will like to get the report, and I'll try to get it through the town manager, that uh, the town would not break up any more than it has past three or four years in terms of building blocks. And if that's the case, I think I read it in the Westbrook Journal. This is reported there, or in the Courier. If that's the case, then uh, our popu school population should remain not much larger than this for a large number of years. And that's extremely important in terms of the long-range building program. Now, if their assumption is right, if their assumption is wrong, then we have a whole new thing to look at. All right. Okay, uh, any questions on the business manager's report? If not, uh, D, thank you very much for the report. And I would a a ask that, Peter, if you could, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I'm sure others do, that it would be, we could change the form of the report and the, the analysis, the budgetary analysis some to give us some measures so that we know if we're high, low, or out of kilter. And so uh, if you all agree with that, could we ask Peter to uh, to uh, sit with the administration and begin that process of developing a new time kind of report? I got that one without even raising my hand. <laughs> you know, you know sounds, how to do it. <laughs> so, sounds good to me, Peter. You know how to do it. OK, great. Um, so you'll, you'll contact them as soon as possible, yes, I, I trust you. Yeah, I will. Great. Uh, the next uh, item, we're now on special items, which are some of the more uh, substantive items. And I hope we can move along promptly. It's 9 o'clock. And this is the presentation of the state uh, educational assessment report, which is the state testing results for the 11th grade, the things that uh, these tests that get all the publicity in the newspaper. And people always want to know how Cape Elizabeth does. So uh, we've asked the high school uh, principal to come and tell us how Cape Elizabeth 11th graders uh, did. Actually, this, this report is going to be in two parts. One is going to be on the main educational assessment. Me, this is Mr. Frank Miles, who is the high school principal, who's going to deliver the report. Yeah, the report will be in two parts, one on, on the main educational assessment and the other by Sharon Merrill will be on the SAT scores of the seniors, um, last year's seniors. So it updates you on the testing, if you will, for the school. Um, you all received um, from us a, a copy of the main educational assessment results, um, which is put out by the state, um, sent to the school each uh, summer, and we get a look at how our students have compared with the, the state of Maine. And I think it's fair to say that each year that of the three years that this program has been going on, Cape Elizabeth schools have compared very well with the state at large. Uh, the students in the class of, of 1989, our, our current senior class who took these tests last March as juniors are the subject of this test report and they should be commended for doing such an excellent job I think on the tests. Um, during the testing they were very attentive, uh, cooperative and very responsible. They worked very hard to ensure that the scores accurately represent uh, them at their best. The test profile for this class represents however, a little bit more of a normal bell curve or distribution of student academic talent than is sometimes the case in Cape Elizabeth. And given this factor, I think that in my judgment, the, 
in the judgment also of Mrs. Merrill, the test results for this class are really excellent. Um, there is a, a, a slightly higher proportion of handicapped students in this testing sample than has been the case previously. Nonetheless, those particular students uh, as a group scored better than handicapped students have in, in previous years. Um, it should be noted, I think, that, that Cape Elizabeth includes a greater percentage of its handicapped students, that is, we include them all, than the state does. So that, for instance, 8% of our sample uh, were, quote, handicapped, and this is a, a technical term, uh, whereas the, the state norms really only include 3% 3, 3 uh, of, of the uh, whole, is, if you will, handicapped. So that there's a little variation there. Nonetheless, I think that the scores are good. If you look at page seven, um, and when I'm finished, I'll be glad to back up and go over anything you want. But the graphic on page seven, uh, I think, um, shows very clearly that this year, the scores are a little bit lower than they were in the past two years, uh, with one exception, that being the score for humanities. There are six, uh, areas, content areas, on which the students are tested. Uh, reading, writing, mathematics, science, social studies, and the humanities. And the, the Cape Elizabeth score this year was always within its comparable range. The state, uh, using demographic indicators, um, makes a series of groupings of schools in the state um, that have the comparable demographics and Cape Elizabeth is right in its range, that is, its scores are consistent with its demographic group. And in fact, the Cape schools are, in, in this 11th grade sample, are consistently in the top, oh, anywhere from four to fourth to third to, to I think, seventh uh, in the state in terms of their ranking. What the state does is it takes its the raw scores and, in a sense, puts them all together in, in a group and scales them. And then what you see here are scaled scores. And given that we're in the very top group, we're also very far out on that curve. So if there's a little bit of variation, like one or two test items, uh, that moves um, a youngster along that scale because they're so high, there are so few students out there in the end that it moves them significantly along the scale, but it's really not very significant, I don't think, educationally. Nonetheless, they're down a little bit. Um, I, I, I think that there are some gender-related gender issues uh, as to why they're down, and I want to talk about those at some length, and Mrs. Merrill will talk about them with the SATs as well. Um, the state of Maine is concerned about the difference in test performance of boys and girls. And when we get to that portion here in just a minute, you'll see that there is quite a difference between the way boys and girls test on these issues. If you look on pages 9 and 10, where the skill areas um, and are very carefully delineated, um, this is a, a new item that the state has done this year. In, in past years, they have not broken those content areas down quite so discreetly. Um, this year, um, mathematics, for example, uh, since the folks that are watching on television can't, can't see all this, nor could they really see it if we put it up on an overhead very, very handily. Mathematics is broken down, for example, into numbers and numeration, variables and relationships, geometry, measurement, problem-solving skills, other topics, computation, concepts, routine applications, and non-routine applications. And there is a discrete score for our school district on each of those um, items. Similarly, science is broken down into about 20 different uh, subtopics and humanities into 10 and so on. In all of these cases, I think, um, the, the Cape Elizabeth High School um, scores really quite well. There are a few particular things that stand out. For example, we don't teach astronomy, therefore the score on astronomy is way out of line. Uh, that's all right with us. Since we don't teach it, we don't expect it to be very high. Um, one interesting thing under science that is something we are a little 
interested in looking at is the application of higher order thinking skills. Um, that is, our students seem to be very knowledgeable, they seem to be able to do the operations they need to do, but what, what we're really talking about here is probably putting concepts together, synthesizing ideas, and coming up with different conclusions. And um, that's something we would like to be higher on. Frank, excuse me. Sure. On that particular one, I noticed that our score is to the extreme right of the band, whereas with the exception of one other, all the other results are dead center in the band. Which, which, which item are you saying? Well, the one that you just referred to. Application of higher order skills? Knowledge, comprehension, or application. This is under science. Right. To mine, uh, it's dead center in the that band. That one, and then farther down, I think it's philosophy. If I read across, we're at the 400 level. But in every other one of those, if you look at them, our performance is dead center on the comparable band. And right. I don't know if that has any significance at all, but it struck my eye. All right, what slips by you on the, the way the state puts these reports is on the preceding page, page seven, where it said summary of test results, the band there shows you where we are in relation to comparable schools. But on page nine, Peter, that is not what that band suggests. And if I get in trouble, Mr. Doerr is going to bail me out. Close enough. <laughs> Mr. Doerr will explain to you what the standard error of measurement is, because all, as I understand it, and I am really a layman when it comes to testing as opposed to a professional, um, if we were to give 100 students this test, on several different days, that band simply represents the area in which their scores might fall. If they were given the test over a period of days. Do you see what I mean? In other words, it's really your margin of error on either side, and that's why, in most cases, you're dead center. Is that close uh, enough, Wayne, in terms of a layman's? Uh, it, it sounds more like they, they didn't measure it. They just placed it. No, what they really said was, if our high school were to take the test again, let's take any one of those indicators. Let's take scientific inquiry, which is the first one in science. All right, our, our school score is 380. They're saying that on a given day, it could vary from say 353 to all the way to 400. Oh, okay. All right, on any given day, but that on that particular day, our actual score or our actual scaled score was 380. Next time, tomorrow it might be 370. Do you see what I'm saying? And so they're saying, as long as those bands are, are close to each other, or in fact overlap, um, there's no great variance right on down through the, through the discipline. So what you really want to look for, if you really want to fine tune the analysis here, is, is to look for the one on application of higher order skills. You'll notice it doesn't overlap with um, the one immediately above it. It does overlap with the group, however. Um, so that it, we're consistently in, say, the 300 to 350 range in science, I think would be the, the, the broad spectrum in science. Thank you. It, it's, I'm, I'm not sure that it's really productive to sit and worry about these. They're interesting in terms of, of getting those of us in the school to begin to look at our curriculum and say, how do these test scores indicate to us that we're doing on the curriculum that we intend to teach. We do not wish to let the tests dictate to us our curriculum, but it does make us challenge our own thinking and examine whether or not we're, we're not doing something we intend to do as well as we ought to do it. So that the department chairman and I will sit down and they in turn with their colleagues and look at these individual areas and begin to say, what do we want to do, if anything, differently? Uh, not, not necessarily to score well here, but because we think we ought to do it, all right? And that's what uh, I want to make sure that we understand that. Yes? The, uh, just to give you a little historical perspective on how the school board in the past, which was a different group of people, looked at these things, they, the, the view was, well, the state is doing this and spending this money so that uh, people in the community do have an idea of how their school is faring relative to other schools in the state. And when they started this, our view was that uh, Cape Elizabeth, let's look at the demographics, supposedly, according to the state planning office, has the high, highest per capita income in the state, it 
has the highest educational level in the state in terms of uh, parents of uh, school children, and that therefore the kids should perform very well on this. Also has the highest local commitment of dollars per student in the state of Maine. And we're comparing Cape Elizabeth's performance on these tests to many school districts in the state of Maine that have far fewer advantages, both in terms of family advantages and school system advantages. And for instance, when I look, uh, I look at U.S. history and the performance of our high school students relative to their counterparts in other high schools in this state, in all 16 counties, we don't stand out at all. We're right in the middle. We're average. You're talking about the, the 20th century one? Yeah. We're yeah. average. Keep in mind that the, the students who take this test are juniors and are taking U.S. history, and that when they take the test in March, they have just finished, if you will, studying the 19th century. They haven't, if you, in a sense, the, their last formal instructional contact with studying U.S. history in the 20th century was in the middle school. I assume that, that I assume that other school systems have that's the same. that's true, that's true, but some schools in fact don't. Some schools teach it in the tenth grade. Um, a fair, well, I don't know. In, I don't. I'm not sure in Maine. I do know in. Okay, but in, if you take all of it together. That's right. In summary, uh, you say we rank from third to seventh. We certainly don't rank first. That's correct. That's that's for sure. Uh, somebody who. Ex some other school system that has uh, demographic data that has a little lower family educational level, a little lower income level, a little lower commitment, dollar commitment per student ranks above us. Has to be, according to the state planning office. Yeah, because I we're number one in those categories, but we're not number one on the educational achievement test. Yeah, I, I think that, that in fact, um, we are so close to number one that we are nitpicking here. Are there, for example, uh, the, the school district that I think scored highest consistently this year was Falmouth, mm -hmm. okay? Um, they are, if you will, where I think CAPE was when this test was first given. Um, and I think that with regard to schools of both Falmouth and Cape Elizabeth's um, demographics, um, this, the slight variation as to whether you're first, third, fifth, or seventh may vary a little bit with the composition of each class. And in fact, the, the, the distribution of academic ability within a given class. And because these are small high schools, where you have a small sample that can be significantly influenced by a small number of students, um, I, th I think you, you will spend a lot of time you know, swatting at gnats if you worry about being number one every year. If you end up moving from the, what I would call the top tier to the second tier, that's a concern. But I think if you're in the uh, top five or ten schools in the state consistently, and I think Cape Elizabeth will be there, um, I don't think you're varying very much significantly in terms of the test scores. Uh, you're, you're varying on the scale, but in terms of absolute test scores, um, what I understand from both the state test analysts and the local test analysts is um, because of the construction of the bell curve, we're way out on the tail. And just a little variation in actual score is going to move us along. Well, I think uh, just to clarify that, the numbers that we're perhaps more familiar with, the standard deviation from 350 to 400, that is one standard deviation as I understand this arithmetic. That, speaking from memory, represents 1.7% of the schools. If you go to the next standard deviation, you pick up another 13%, again speaking from memory. So from 300 to 400, you're only talking about 15%. So that's the bell curve that uh, Frank is talking about. And the first part of it is less than 2%, and the next slope is 13%. Right. And we're in those, in that uh, uh, first the variation of one or two, right? yeah, one or two answers on a test will make the difference between whether we're first or fifth in terms of an average for the school. 
So I, I really think, you know, I understand your concern, and I think you want to you want to ensure that if we have the, and I don't know that we have exclusive uh, control of the number one demographic rating in the state. I think there are others that are. A similar, State very similar. The State Planning Office says that there's nobody quite similar to Cape Elizabeth, including I, Yarmouth, Yarmouth, Wyndham, Scarborough. Whatever. I certainly wouldn't know to argue with them, yes. I think the key is the 8% that were handicapped this year. I think that's Maybe, may but I think there's more to percent. it than that. Let's go on to, to, to the page that breaks down the demographics between um, students. If you look at this, the scores, and I... In, in looking at those differences between boys and girls, this is on page 12, I believe. The state is quite concerned about the gender gap in certain uh, of these test scores. Um, generally, girls outscore the boys in reading and writing, and the boys outscore the girls in math and science. In fact, if you look at the performance of the Cape Elizabeth boys over the last three years, that is the three years that the tests have been given, the boys' reading score has gone up slightly from 367 to 381 over the last three years. It's gone up a little bit each year. The writing score was very high the first year, but then dropped last year, and then this current year is up a little bit. The math score is, is essentially unchanged. Uh, as is the science score, and the social studies score drops very little, like 15 points from 400 to 385. The humanities score goes up. The conclusion would be the boys in the high school over the past three years have been remarkably consistent in their scoring. They haven't changed basically a whit. But in this particular class, uh, the girls normally read very well, but this group, for some reason, didn't. And there, this is, you know, this, that's just where that is. Writing, the girls are predictably very strong. But in math, they're dramatically down. They're down to 292. In science, they're down. They went from 360 last year to 280. They're down in social studies a little bit and in humanities a little bit. Now, I submit to you that that's just part of the variation you're going to find in groups of youngsters moving through your schools. And that I would not read a whole lot into that, but I think it explains some of the drop that you're seeing. And I think that if you want to look for an explanation, that's an explanation. I think the, the young women in the senior class are a distinguished group, will do very well for themselves, thank you. And, uh, but but if, in terms of these test scores, that, I think, accounts for the variation in scores more than any other thing. Because if you go down and you look at the students who took the, the, the testing with a certifiable handicap condition, in fact, their scores are above previous years. They're not much above, but they're above. And so although there are more of them, they're also a little higher than they've been in the past, and I'm not sure that we can really... Um, attribute a great change to that. I think Mrs. Merrill, when she talks about the SAT scores, will further delineate, again, the problem of a gender gap. And I think the state is concerned about that, and I think most educators in the country are. We're not quite sure that there's any good reason why men should not be as facile with language as women seem to be, nor is there any good reason why women shouldn't be as facile with math and science as the men seem to be. Now, one can say that that's genetic. One can go into, there's all sorts of scholarly explanations put forth. But I think to those of us in the schools, I think we think that uh, they may be a bit hollow and that we ought to look at that pretty hard. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here's our Sharon? Incidentally, before Sharon begins, at some point, you know, the last couple of years, Daryl, you have given us, I understand it's not coming tonight, a comparison with our SAT performance with other school districts in New England and right. one outside, Scarsdale. 
Let me tell you what I have. I called today. I called today. I, I do have, will have, Westchester County, because they've been published. I made the call. And uh, now that they're published, see, I can get those. And right. then I'll, I'll get the Oh, yes, I'll get Fairfield County. Yeah. All so right. those will come to you uh, so that you could keep these handy and you can compare them. We've done that now for three years. Three years. And it's and, and, and the reason is that people felt that kids here were competing with children from not just the 16 counties Absolutely. of Maine. And how do we, how do our kids stack up as a group? We sort of tend to look at uh, Darien and uh, Scarsdale. Like See if you can get Hingham or someplace like that. <laughs> Stay away from Newton. Well, you know, we could go back three years on these tests and you put St. Agut, 36 kids in St. Agut at the top. Sure. So sometimes I wonder. Yeah, right. St. Agut is on the Canadian border. It's on the left side of the street, I think. I've never been there. But He's, what do you say? He's from there. I know. <laughs> I know I'm from there. So when you talk about a small group making a difference, in the first year, there was a community there with 36 kids that were taught, taught by nuns for the most part. Yeah. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, a few comments about uh, the class of 1988 to characterize um, this class's performance on um, the SAT exam. Um, this is a class that is now freshmen in college or in the work world, um, whatever their plans uh, they chose to do. Um, the students in this class of 1988 continued to test well, testing substantially above the national average. They also continued to test well on the achievement tests, and their, their post-secondary plans continue to demonstrate a high percentage of students continuing their education beyond high school. We'll walk through this report here this evening, and um, this is the new format that uh, was made available by ETS a year ago. It uh, provides sociological data and the score results in relation to the test-taking population, and it, it permits us to view their results in, re in uh, relation to their academic preparation, which is very helpful. Um, it's, it's been a very um, helpful innovation on the part of the ETS reporting. So I will walk through the material, and if you have questions, please make note of them, and then we can go back and look at the, the items. As we walk through the report, I'm sure that you will notice that there is indeed a close relationship between the types of courses that students take, as well as the grades that they achieve in high school, and the result in SAT scores. What you will note is that students who take more coursework, who take more challenging courses, achieve higher scores. You would also uh, be wise to, to keep in mind that students who take the more challenging courses in high school also possess stronger ranges of academic talent. So we have to keep both of these things in mind as we look through the test report. Um, I'll try to point this out here as we through the report, um, the class of 88 had an average verbal score of 465. This is 37 points above the national average score. They had a math score of 500, which is 24 points over the national average. Um, when we get to page six of the report, I'll stop and we'll pay a little bit more attention to the difference between male and female scores. Are all these, are these 126 seniors or are these the people that took the SATs last spring? Are some of them juniors or are they all seniors? These are all seniors. Mm -hmm. um, the report tells us that uh, 16, let me see, 29 of the students' scores come from their junior year, 
meaning that they didn't retest their senior year and that 93 of the seniors, um, their scores are coming out of the senior year. On the next page of the report, we start to see some of the information broken out in terms of uh, students' high school rank. Um, Mrs. Ridland just passed an addendum to you on class rank, which you should find it's just passed around the table to you. This high school ranking that's in the report is self-reported by students, and, and we find that some of the students use their weighted class rank and some use their unweighted class rank. Um, so that makes that information extremely unreliable as it's presented there. But if you look at the class ranking and the resultant uh, verbal and math means, you will see a very logical picture there which shows you that um, the higher the students are ranking in the class, the higher they're scoring on the SAT exam. And you can just follow the uh, ranking down through the tenths and the fifths and see that the scores change logically as you would expect. Excuse me, on, on the, uh, the verbal score in the top ten, is 560 um, pretty much where it is every year or is that lower? Uh, 560 on the top 10. I don't have last year's report here with me, but um, that's a very strong score. Um, the national average being 435. So they're uh, 130 points above on their verbal score. I can get that information for you. I just don't have it with me this evening. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, same in relation to the high school grade point average. Uh, as the student's grade point average changes, then very logically you see the uh, SAT score changing in a very logical pattern. Total years of study in academic subjects, that's the total numbers of years in six subject areas. And again, you see a very logical pattern. The longer the students are in school, the more academic courses they've taken, the higher the scores average out. Under plans for advanced placement in college, um, there's a very light scatter there. We start to see uh, larger numbers in English. Students planning to take advanced placement in college, probably as a, as a result of the fact that we have two advanced placement programs in the high school. Uh, same for foreign languages, probably as a result of the fact that we have four and five years of language in high school and students planning to do advanced placement in college. And same for mathematics, most likely because we have five years of math in high school. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say something that isn't very nice, but uh, look at the cost effectiveness of that. If you get three hours of uh, foreign language or three hours of English, at any one of the take any school that's uh, charging 14,000 divided by 32 this is really cost effective instruction what are you looking at looking at the advanced placement the person get passes the advanced placement test in a college eg the take any you know mediocre school take yale for example yeah if uh, you had uh, three hours of a foreign language at freshman to Yale and three hours of English, that's six hours. If the tuition bill is 14000 uh, you get 32 in the freshman year generally. See how cost effective this is? Are you sure that's right? Don't you still have to make it up in another subject? You still have to have a certain number of hours to graduate. Yeah. You just don't take it in three hours of no, freshman regular English. You take it in an advanced. You wouldn't have to take a freshman English course yeah, but if you got the advanced placement. Oh no, they make credit. it. They all have these core requirements now where you have to. At Harvard, if you have the baccalaureate, yeah. you go in as a sophomore. You don't take any freshman courses. Is that right? The Yale is the same way. Well, advanced placement, isn't that so? That's what advanced placement. It's a good institution, though. They make you. They make you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> take <laughs> core requirements. <laughs> no, my point was that. Uh, in some schools where they allow advanced placement, it's cost effective. 
So you just graduate with that many fewer hours. Right, and no, you, you get credit already, and it's all paid for, so you don't have to pay for it. So your tuition bill would be minus three hours of cost. Hmm. That's what I'm saying. Though. So if you had the whole freshman year, you could do the whole college program in three years and save a significant amount when it's 14000 a year. Well, what does that mean for us here in Cape Elizabeth? <laughs> Well, it would it, it would mean the following: uh, if as college cost goes up, we probably should give considerable thought to enlarging the advanced placement program, so that youngsters who can do it could do it cheaper here than they can at some of the schools they'll go to. Atta boy, Darrell, I'm with you now. now let me Why give you an example. Let me give you an example, and I'll use a school that some of us know. A school called Princeton that took a young lady last year in this area who had completed college uh, in three I mean, completed her high school program in three years. Now I'm going to find out if she saved fifteen thousand dollars. I'm sure she did, but I'm going to get that for the record. Sharon, perhaps you know that. She went to Williams. Oh <laughs> <laughs> she did, honestly. She did? Yeah. But we should find that out. I mean, she turned Princeton down. I think that should be said for the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're off Scarsdale anyway. <laughs> but uh, you're making a, a good I point. Um, a point. <laughs> we're, we're finding that there's real inconsistency in whether or not colleges accept AP credit because we're, we're graduating seniors who are getting fours and fives on the AP exam. And we get reports back. One college will give credit. Uh, we'll put it on the student's transcript. Another college says we don't recognize that. Congratulations, you did a nice job. Um, but it's it's very inconsistent, unfortunately. Um, now, on page three, we're moving on to coursework. Um, under English, everybody takes three or four years of English. So depending on whether they're reporting uh, their SAT from their junior or senior year, you can see a score difference. But I, I think what's a clearer um, contrast is if a student has taken honors courses or not, and those who have, you know, we see a dramatic um, climb in, in the score. Keeping in mind that, you know, we have some very talented students in those courses. Um, art, music, um, we don't really have an Excuse honors program second. there. Uh, sure. Honors courses taken. If we compare that to, um, your percentage high school rank, you say in the top 10th of the class, you had 13 takers, right? On your pro 1988 profile? Well, I guess actually my point is not a good one. Go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think that's the self-reported students rank yeah. in class, and that's the one that's not accurate. Okay, Yeah. all right. Okay, let's move along to um, social studies, page four. Um, social studies, giving a breakdown of courses, and there's a real smattering there because our students are pretty much locked into history government civics, that's where the large numbers are, um, Western Civ, which they report as European history, and then um, honors courses at the very bottom. And you can again see how the scores change in those groups. Foreign languages, we're still showing a few Latin scholars back when we had Latin two years ago, um, but we're showing French, Latin, Spanish, a few Russian, students, and we're picking up the fact that some of our students are apparently studying languages privately because uh, we have Hebrew, Greek, and German, and we're not teaching those, but um, we, it shows us we have some numbers of students here who are studying language privately, which I think is interesting. Under honors courses, you, you should consider that fourth and fifth year of language. Our students know that, that their fourth and fifth year of language is an honors course, and they're reporting that here, and they're um, average SATs out of that group. 
page five, science. Um, what we're seeing here is large numbers of students taking biology, chemistry, physics, which our students do. That's our most traditional science courses. You can see that uh, those students are reporting very strong math scores. And you also have the honors uh, group at the bottom of that report group with a 561 math score. It's a very strong testing group. Under mathematics, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, large number of numbers of our students there. Um, and the more math the students have had, the scores climb, uh, moving all the way to calculus. And that group of 26 students reporting a 612 math score. Um, that is even higher than the honors group, which is students who are taking um, algebra, geometry, and trig on an honors level as compared to the calculus group. But whichever, those are very strong scores. Page six, uh, we're starting to get into sociological information. Uh, this starts to point out the difference in scores for males and females, which have been talked about earlier this evening on the main achievement test. The males um, this year are scoring seven points higher than the females. A year ago, the females were nine points ahead of the males on this test. So we're seeing a change here with this group. And we're seeing, um, I think, a significant uh, difference in score in the math. Uh, 479 for the female students, 530 for the male students. That's a 49-point spread. I haven't had a, a great deal of time to study this or, or get background information on this class to find out um, about the um, just studying their testing background as a group. However, we did get their um, SAT scores and we rank ordered them and we rank ordered the males and the females and we found that in this particular class, um, last year's senior class, the males were scoring really well in math consistently through the whole class. Um, there were just the first 20 males when we rank ordered the highest uh, ranking male on down, the first 20 males in the class, uh, there was not a math score under 500. Uh, and then as we moved on, we started to get into 400s, but there are just many 500s um, in this particular senior class. And they're just very talented mathematically. Um, and that's as, as much as we can say about them at this point. And it's, and it's certainly showing up. And they certainly helped to bring the class average up to a 500 math score, which is very good for the whole class. Um, also on page six, uh, we get to see that we are not a very diverse group uh, ethnically, that we are 110 um, white students. We have uh, one other group. Uh, other ethnic group, and we have one student from another country, and that would have been one of our exchange students who chose to take the SAT while they were in um, our school. Does that, does that complete your report, Sharon, on that page? Page yes. 8, the last day? Okay. No, there oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I was going to ask you questions. Well, there's, there's 12 pages. Oh, okay. Well. The other information, I would ask you to look through it and, and see if there are parts that are of interest to you that we can stop and um, take a look at. There are um, areas of information about income of family income, intended college major, uh, level of parent education, degree goal for students. And then subscores on page nine. Any questions about those areas at all? <coughs> uh, 
It does not test this area. It reports the score in relation to how many years of, of study that they've had in art and music. Yeah. I can show you in just a minute. to make any meaningful um, we're above it um, this is going to be a diverse group academically it's a graduation requirement every capable Zippa student has to take a, a, a music or an art or fine arts course so we're We've got just a diverse group here together who've, who've in fact done that requirement for graduation. Yep. Sharon, um, when you said that our top 20 males scored 500 or in the 500s, mm -hmm. I'm not real clear. If, if the top score is 800 on the SAT, why that is wonderful. I guess I would have expected our top 20 or our top 20 anybody <laughs> to be scoring in the six and seven hundred. Mm -hmm. It was 500 or higher that the first 20 scores uh, never went below 500. They started in the 700s, 600s, and uh, never went below 500. Yeah. I think page, is it page nine that shows that? Yeah, why don't we get, can we move along actually to page nine? The, the, only, the only reason I suggest that, Mr. Superintendent and Sharon, is that it's very hot in here and it's getting late. And uh, I think we should begin, if we can, Sharon, without breaking the continuity of your presentation, focus yes. on the distribution of test scores for for our school. I think that's really what we're, page we're interested in. It's page nine, and, and if we can cover page nine and get our questions out, I think we'll have accomplished something. And then uh, at the next meeting, Daryl, you can use this distribution on page nine and compare it to some of these other selected school districts, which is, I think, what the board's interested in. Yeah. OK. Sharon, I'd suggest you explain the right-hand side of, uh, or the left and right-hand side of page nine. That would answer the questions, I'm sure. Okay, uh, page nine. On on the right is math scores. On the left is verbal with male, female total numbers. In the middle is um, the score range, and so you can look at, for example, um, the males under math, and you can look at the number of males who got a 650 to an 690. There were 10. Um, those who got 70, 700 to 740, there were three, and so on. And you can see the range of uh, math for both m males and females, and also verbal. Um, you can see that there's a, a larger uh, clustering of males on the upper end for math, um, and that their cluster drops on the verbal side. And then for females, they cluster a little bit, in, you know, upper part on verbal and drop on the math side. Um, then you have total numbers and average scores at the bottom. Now, actually, um, 
that particular bar, if you're, if you're looking at how well the boys scored on the math test from 500 to 800, if you total up those percentages, that is uh, 50, that's over 60% of the class scored with a 500 or better. 60% scored 500 or better. So just some really strong mathematical talent in this, this group of male students. Any questions that you'd like to ask? Any comments? At the bottom is reading comprehension and um, the males 47.0 for females 46.5 and vocabulary the males 47.1, females 46.1, and the total out of 46. Um, on the next page is the test of standard written English, which is scored a little bit differently. That scored 200 to 600. 600 plus is the highest score that you can get. Uh, traditionally, a stronger area for female students, and they do score better here. They have a 47.4 average score, and their scores are, there are 71 females in this class versus 51 males, and you can see there's a large cluster of females at the top of this scale um, scoring really well in writing. About 50 students who have um, a 50 or higher. Is this a consideration with colleges, these scores? Yes. It's, um, you mean on the individual student reports? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is reported uh, as a subcategory. Uh, reading Comprehension, Vocabulary, and TSWE, Test of Standard Written English. Yeah. If there are no questions on that, um, we can move along to Achievement Tests, Scores. Now, what I'd like to do here is, um, you can see that our student score is reported in the middle of the column. For example, in the first column, there's achievement average, ACH average, and that is all of our students testing on all achievement scores, and that averaged out to a 530 average score. And you can see at the t above that, it says that 61 students took achievement tests. That's 50% of the class. I'd like to give you the national average score just so that you can compare how our students did in relation to the national population. It's important information because um, only 20% of the students nationally take this test, whereas 50% of our students do. And they compare very favorable, and I think it's, it's helpful information. So under uh, achievement average score, if you'd write the average national score down, that is uh, 543. Under English composition with 57 students testing, we have a 522, and the national average score is 521. Under literature, with 12 students testing, that's a very difficult exam. Um, our students average 517. The national average is 528. American history, with 13 students testing, a score of 517, and the national average is 529. The next uh, subject area, Math 1, a Cape Elizabeth score of 543, and the national average score is 549. Uh, and then moving over to biology, the Cape Elizabeth score 571, and the national average is 553. Chemistry, Cape Elizabeth score 536, and the national average is 577. Uh, physics, very small group testing with a 580, and the national average is 599. And the last area that's reported is French. Um, the national average score is 543 as compared to the Cape Elizabeth average of 555. So um, with the large numbers of students testing, um, they do really well on the achievement test. They're very difficult. Um, an average score on these is 100 points above an average SAT, and it's just a more challenging exam. So. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Superintendent. Much. Thank you very much, Sharon, for that report. Appreciate it. When are you going to give us the comparison bill? Next meeting? As soon as I get it. All right. I'll call today, and I should have them in a week. Okay. 
The next thing on the agenda, Mr. Chairman, is the uh, second reading of the policy on pupil evaluation team. That's been changed in line with board input, and this would be the second reading. Well, I have a question about it right off the bat. All right. The last time, what we, I think the issue we discussed is whether uh, people, uh, uh, people in the administration other than the superintendent had the right to, on their own to commit the resources of the system to, for instance, send a child away to a twenty-five dollars or $30,000 a year uh, school. And I think we said we wanted that passed by the superintendent. That's not in here. And, and we're back. <coughs> what we have here is it says that this policy provides authorization to the superintendent, one of the people that has the authorization, the special education director, another person who has the authorization, building principals, assistant principals, etc. each of them, the way it's written, to obligate the fiscal resources of the district. So uh, if, from my point of view, uh, this is unacceptable. Let me ask uh, Wayne, uh, does the, uh, or let's put it another way, can this be written to comply with the state regulation that uh, uh, the determination of where a student goes is the prerogative of the superintendent, period? No. Okay. Now, if that's the case, it, do, do we have to include principals, assistant principals, lead teachers, and all these people, and give them the authority to do this by state regulation? Well, by state regulation, we have to authorize someone at the PEC to obligate the human and fiscal resources required by the student's IEP. That's right. our Could we add a phrase? Uh, authorization uh, sanctioned by the superintendent? That's what the board's asking for, right? Yeah, I guess what, I, if, if we could, I'd just like to see the regulation. Okay. We can read the regulation, then maybe we can figure out some language that accommodates the concern of the board and meets the regulation. Sure. I, I would point out that <coughs> This is a policy statement and not a definition of the procedures to follow to, to carry that policy out. And we have multiple procedures to carry this policy out, which in fact involves the superintendent and myself and the principals in any unique recommendations forthcoming on a student and to take your specific example Harold there are a number of procedures which precede any recommendation by any pet and anyone at the pet prior to that kind of recommendation being placed in an IEP inclusive of my conversations with the superintendent about a forthcoming recommendation. Well, well, That's procedural. This is policy. Well, I and I understand, Wayne, the difference between procedure and policy. Mm -hmm. And procedure has to be consistent with policy. Therefore, we worry about policy first, and then worry about procedure. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if I would prefer uh, just to wait uh, one more meeting and we we'll bring uh, the policy. Yeah. Well, would it be enough to just simply say in the final paragraph, in conclusion, it is the policy of this school system to obligate the necessary human and fiscal resources, et cetera, without defining the procedure? Well, didn't we say at the last meeting that we wanted the superintendent to be the yes. ultimate decision maker as to who receives special services? Well, no, we didn't, not that we, yeah, the ultimate decision maker as to commitment, uh, committing the district, committing the committing district the to an expenditure fine. of some substantial resources, and I don't care even if the word substantial is in there, it's fine with me, but he's saying that it may, that may be contrary to state regulation, and so I would prefer to read the state regulation first. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. I, I certainly will. 
provide that to the superintendent to pass on to you in the interim, and we can uh, deliberate upon uh, two things. One, um, with the state's attorney on this matter. We well, don't get the state's attorney involved yet. Let us, in other words, well, let's not get all the legal beagles up in Augusta involved, or we're really going to drown in this stuff. I, That's, why do we need to get them involved? Why can't because we? Because they're the, the interpreters for us, Harold, and I well, don't make this kind of a decision. Well, without but how about letting your school board yeah. at least have a crack at this? Aren't you willing to let your school board have a crack at this first before you run off to Augusta? Sir. That's all we're asking. The key is we have to find a way to comply with the policy and comply with the wishes of the board. Right. We'll reread the policy. We'll come up with something that way. And if we're in violation, we'll check it. We'll check it. We'll check it then. I mean, we don't want to so But I will we say that sometimes lawyers from Augusta who always think they're right, courts have on occasion said they are wrong. And so before we go to them, we want to take a look at the regulation. That's all we're saying. Why don't we add to this process the procedure you mentioned? Well, it would be appropriate to have a procedure. A regulation. And, and that was the second addition to this, that we would provide for you a structural procedure for following. In line with that will, in fact, show you how the superintendent is in the decision-making room. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Okay. One last uh, request. A uh, very quick change in the middle school workshop calendar. Uh, Miss communication uh, while we changed the calendars three calendars this year uh, we did not provide for work days workshop days shortened days for the middle school uh, they would like the following november 16 december 7 january 25th february 8th and march 15th these are staff development days and i would recommend that we officially change the middle school calendar no one else yeah before, before you do that uh, Darrell, I got a call from somebody, and I felt very badly that I couldn't answer the question from a, uh, uh, from a citizen who added up all of these days and subtracted and said, I think you've got less days where the kids are in the classroom this year than you had last year. The answer to that is no. We have 175 days this year. That's what we had last year. However, we called it something different what we last did. year. Last year, we put 180 days to the calendar yeah. because we added the snow days. Now, when we didn't get the snow days, the superintendent comes to the board and says, we can quit on Monday or Tuesday. Oh, so we quit early. We always quit at 175. And that's been historically done here, always listing 180 days on the school calendar. Now, let me get ask you one question. How does that stack up? Because we all may get be asked these questions. How does that stack up with other... Uh, school districts around here that 175 days of school I think uh, do you know what well, maybe you don't know offhand in which case I'd say to you can you send us a note on that I'll give you Rockland counties because we do it collectively they will come come on county yeah, I mean sorry yeah I'm in the so Maine it's 1988 <laughs> 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 Okay, so if you could do that, because uh, people wonder how we stack up. We talked about longer school day, but we have Sure. Now, uh, the next item is other business, and we better vote on those. Oh, days. those days. Days, days. Yeah. So moved. Peter, so moved. Second. You seconded it. All in favor? All opposed? It's a vote. They correspond to the elementary shortened days too, yeah. so that won't be. Easier. Okay, now other business. Yes, um, I'd like at some point to have an update from the schools on how the time is being, the extra half an hour is being used and how it's working out. I, I, there have been some concerns in the community that I know of at the elementary and middle school levels that um, perhaps the extra half an hour is not being used for academics, but for other things. And I would like to okay. get a report on that. Happy to. Put a report on the next board meeting. Uh, Betty? 
report on the extended half hour in each school the i'd like to mention this to the superintendent before and meeting that he and I had, but I'd, I'd like to let all of you know and the public know that uh, one of the things that I, I would like to do with the superintendent and whoever else on the board is interested in this issue to participate with me in it is to look at the fields maintenance program for uh, all of the fields that the town maintains, uh, but the school, that there's actually school fields. Uh, one of the things that led to this, that we have an excellent public works department and an excellent public works director. I think they're spread thin. Uh, they're, at this stage, not a lot of pride taken in the condition of the athletic fields at these schools. Uh, simply because it's just a job to get done with all of the other pressing matters that, that they have. And if you compare the fields here to some of the school districts in this state and others, where there are people who are employed for the purpose of maintaining the fields, they're a lot different. Now, we have a brand new field over there next to the bus garage that the state paid a lot of money to have built. And it's a brand new field, and if you any of you have the opportunity, you walk over there and you can see that it just didn't come up right. I mean, it's bumpy. Uh, there's uh, just big, the, the grasses are in clumps. Uh, it is not a good field. And I think this is something that, that is out of our control right now, not, not to be out of our control. We went through this before, we, went, we transferred this over to the town two, three years ago. Now I think we at least got to re-examine that for the reason with budget. But we got to re-examine it because I think we have an obligation to uh, to make sure that these fields are first class. These kids play on them. I went over there. There was a bunch of second and thir third and fourth graders playing on the soccer field, that brand new one, and there was a bunch of uh, irrigation pipe laying right on the sidelines with the sprinkler system sticking up. And, uh, you know, that's just one example. So uh, we have a responsibility, and I'd like to, and I told the superintendent this, and we're going to get together, and whoever else wants to participate should, and whoever else in the town is interested in this issue should contact us. You agree with that, Director of Community Services? Let the record show that she nodded her head in affirmation. <laughs> I conveyed uh, the, uh, the, this problem to uh, the maintenance chief, and he's willing to sit down with us. Yeah. And now that the town manager is back, see, I wanted him to be part of this. Okay, so we'll do it as soon as we can. We'll set up a meeting. I'm going to, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I'll ask Sue to set that up. Okay. Since she's in charge of uh, all the fields. I just wanted to find out whether the school board had, you know, thinks that we shouldn't discuss it or has any special concerns or whatever. That's the reason I wanted to raise it here tonight. Apparently not, so uh, are there any other items that people want to bring up under other business? If not, uh, we consider a date for the uh, next meeting. That's the next uh, item on the agenda. Well, I think we're scheduled for November 8th, which is election night. Which you, you should probably move. Beg your pardon? You probably move. I think it would be patriotic to move to another night of the week. That happens once every four years. I would, I would very much like to have that night free if you're... Okay. You all agree? Agree. What night is it? Well, they haven't moved. They want to move it from the November 8th, 8th is election night. Yeah. I, I'm open to any suggestions. I mean, what, whatever fits. How about Tuesday the 15th? What, that's a problem? Well. Is it? What's Tuesday the 15th? Open house? No, if he, if, if one of the principals can't come, that's all right. Do we? We aren't going to get a night for everybody's free. Yeah. 
so uh, why don't we set it for 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, November 15th. We'd have to check with the town with television, yeah. cameras. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are not any other uh, items under other business, uh, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purposes of nego uh, discussing negotiations. A motion has been made by Mrs. Pond to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Motion has been seconded by Mr. Holt. All in favor, please signify by raising the hand. All opposed, we will then go into executive session immediately because it's late.